Very often, the biggest competitor to a business is not another business. The biggest competitor is non-consumption. People just not doing this yet, not purchasing this in this way. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hey, Josh, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thanks, Hala. It's great to be here. I'm very excited for this conversation. I think the topics that you discuss are super relevant for my audience and everyone's going to love what we're going to talk about today because it's a lot of what I get asked all the time. I always get asked, you know, how do I start a side hustle? How do I start a business? How do I learn a new skill? And we're going to talk about all of that today. So super hyped for this conversation. Yeah, like, likewise. Uh, business is fun to talk about. So so let's do it. It is. So Josh, you are a very diverse person. You launched the personal MBA. It was a book that, you know, was a breakout success. You put it out over 10 years ago and it's now in its 10th edition. It's still a bestseller a decade later. You also have a really big popular TED talk. It's called The First 20 Hours and it's one of the most popular TED talks out there. Um, but I was doing some research and I noticed that your college degree is very different from what you do now. You went into school for business information systems, which is relevant, but real estate and philosophy as well. And some things that I, some, some of the stuff that I talk about on this podcast is related to skill stacking and kind of, you know, acquiring skills over your experiences. And so I want to understand how has your college degree helped shape your career in life? And have you used anything from your college degree later on in life as a successful author and speaker? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of things. I've always been curious by nature about how the world works. And uh, part of that is is reading and researching, but it's also projects and like doing things to understand. And so uh, my, my background is in technology. Um, as, as you said, I have a, a business information systems degree. It's so funny. I'm actually doing more programming now post degree for my own business because I have a need that I can now solve with technology. Uh, than, than I did at, at any time, either during college or or in my uh, corporate career post college. Uh, but I, I think there's there's a lot of value, and this is reflected in uh, the third part of my my book, the Personal MBA. Being able to think in systems and understand the world in in a process oriented way or or in a systems oriented way is very valuable, very useful. Um, it, it helps you solve problems. It helps you understand what's going on in a way that is difficult to do in any other way. And, and so I think it's, if I took anything from that technology or, or engineering background, it was that systems orientation. Um, for me, the, the real estate was, was funny. Um, real estate for me was, was less of a, an interest in the nuts and bolts of at, at that time, commercial real estate, like the actual transaction level but a way, a, a very applied, very practical way of learning finance. And so, mm -hmm. you know, when you take a, a finance course in, in college, it's all at this very abstract level. You know, here's a balance sheet, here's an, an income statement, here's a cash flow statement. And a lot of the, the concepts make sense, sort of, but it's really hard to visualize what's going on. But when you imagine something like, I'm going to build a commercial office building, and then I'm going to have X number of floors to lease, and it's going to uh, cost a certain amount to build it out. It's going to cost a certain amount for insurance and taxes. And you create something called a pro forma, which is kind of like the business plan for a building. All of a sudden, all of these very abstract financial concepts start making a lot more sense because they're attached to something tangible in the real world. And so, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I studied real estate not because I wanted to buy and sell real estate, but because it was a very uh, practical, useful way for me to learn finance. And um, philosophy is, is and continues to be a, a, a big thing that I think about. Um, so the personal MBA really is a book about business philosophy. Like when we're doing business, what are we doing? You know, what is the point? What is the purpose? What are the, uh, the things that we can pay a lot of attention to 
And what are the things that we don't need to, to worry about so much or, or are distractions from the core of this thing that we're doing when we're running a business? And, and so, yeah, that, that approach to really trying to understand at a fundamental level what we're doing and what's important and what's not, um, that, that is in the same way that engineering was an influence in how I think about business, uh, philosophy definitely is too. Yeah. So like I, that's all very interesting. And like I said before, you're very well known for writing this book called The Personal MBA. It's, it's a very popular book. People read it in business school. And I'm curious to know, did you go to business school? And how did you decide that you needed to write this book and that there was, you know, demand for a book like this? Yeah, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, so I, I went through an undergraduate business program that was structured like uh, a master's of business administration degree. So, you know, all of the, all of the classic things, the case studies, the, you know, strategy talk, the, you know, all of those, those things I got in the context of my undergrad. And as a result, you know, I was exposed to the best of what business academia had to offer. Um, through that experience, I, I worked in the corporate world for, for a number of years. And so I got the big company managerial executive management experience or, or worldview. And the thing that I noticed, and, and this was something um, that really stuck out at me when, when I was going through, um, through school, which is nobody really took a step back and, and try to, to even define like, what is a business when we're businessing, what are we doing? Um, it, it seems like the general perception of, you know, businesses are things that make money. And if you're making money, you're doing a good business. And the way to become a better business person is to make more money. Like there, there was not that attempt to take a step back and, and really examine what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What's important? And so I was working in, you know, uh, at one of the largest corporations in the world, uh, Procter and Gamble, uh, just out of college, and I was working with people who had just graduated from top fifteen MBA programs, and I wanted to have a greater degree of confidence in my ability to 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 really, you know, really truly know what I'm talking about, to have good mm -hmm. good suggestions, to make good decisions, but for me at that time. It didn't make any sense for me to quit my job, go back to school, borrow a bunch of money. I just, I needed to understand. I needed to be able to do better in, in my job. And so that's where the personal MBA came from. Um, I started doing reading and research on my own. And uh, this was in, in the early heyday of uh, blogs being a thing. Um, I'm kind of dating myself a little bit, but um, it, it was... It was an exciting time to be on the internet. So, so I was doing this project fundamentally for myself, but I was also sharing the things that I was learning with other people. And lo and behold, uh, the, the world is wide and there are many, many people uh, in the world who are interested in, in this sort of thing. It's helpful. And so that's when I realized that this is an idea. This is something that has the potential to help a lot of people. And so that's, that's what turned the personal MBA from a side project into something that that became my uh, my full time work. It's so cool. It's so cool how you had the passion and you were trying to solve a problem for yourself. And then you realized that so many other people had this problem and then you turned it into a business. So it's like kind of like the same things that you preach in your book. You actually did yourself with the personal MBA, which is so cool. So in terms of that book, I, I definitely want to dive in deep. Um, anybody who listens to my show knows that I don't just like talk about this or that. I really dive deep into one or two topics. And so the topic that I want to talk about today is starting a business business. Um, I've had a couple episodes on this. I, I had a, a Yap Snacks episode called Five Steps to Launch a Side Hustle. And I just started a business that's very successful. It's called Yap Media. And so I thought it'd be great to kind of pick your brain in terms of how to start a new business because I know so many of my listeners want to know how to do this in the right way. And a lot of people are starting a new side hustle in COVID. And it's like the hot time to start a new business now. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd love to start off with markets. So one of the first things that you have to do 
when you're thinking about a new business idea is to have a viable market to target a market that you know would have demand in, in your services so what's the best way to go about you know t- determining if your market is a, a good enough market if it's a viable market for your business idea yeah there there are a couple of very useful ideas i talk about in the personal mba directly related to this um one which which you've highlighted uh, brilliantly is that you have to have a market to begin with or the business is, is just not going to work right you know so so if there's not a waiting group of people ready and, and willing to pull out their wallet checkbook and credit card and and say yes please i will take one um you're gonna have a hard time mm-hmm. and so they, there are a couple of things that really help in the process of finding a market that's going to be large enough to support whatever it is that you want to do uh the first and this is related to an idea um called the iron law of the market which is is, i think was was best framed by uh, mark andreessen the now a venture capitalist but but the founder of netscape he just says markets that don't exist don't care how smart you are you can have the most brilliant idea you can have the best technology you can have the best of everything and without a group of people willing to pay you you have nothing when it comes uh, to to the actual operation of a business. The easiest shortcut, which sounds obvious when you hear it or if you think about it, but it's like pay attention to what people are already spending money on because you know there's a 100% certainty that people are buying this particular thing. And if you can offer mm-hmm. it in a better way, in a new way, with a bit of a twist or or to a market that is not used to buying this sort of thing. Very often, the biggest competitor to a business is not another business. The biggest competitor is non-consumption. People just not doing this yet, not purchasing mm-hmm. this mm-hmm. in this way. And so I like to say a, a lot of early stage business formation looks a lot like anthropology. You're going out into the world, you're asking questions, you're looking at what people are doing and what they're not doing and what they maybe could be doing if they just knew that there was a better way of of solving this particular problem. And so, you know, the early stages is you're you're going out, you're examining what people are, are doing, and you're just trying to find opportunities, things that could be a little less frustrating, a little more efficient, a little more flexible, a little more enjoyable. And this is an idea called the hassle premium. And so usually Uh, the more annoying something is, you know, for for a broad definition of annoying, the more people are willing to pay money, perfectly good money to make that annoying thing go away. And so Mm -hmm. sometimes in the the development of a, a, a business, sometimes you're solving a new problem that hasn't been solved yet. But then also sometimes you're taking an existing problem and you're just making it a little bit more fun, less annoying, less of a hassle. From there, it gets to a point of almost triage. So you're going out into the world, you're looking at all of the potential opportunities. And if you're in this frame of mind, it's very easy to come up with a list of 500 things that that you could potentially build a a business out of. The the world is full Mm -hmm. of opportunities like this. The question becomes, which of those opportunities are your best shot? What are the ones that are going to be the most straightforward, the most rewarding, the most interesting? So what should you spend your focus on? And there there are two things that really help with this. The first is understanding the fundamental structure of a business, what a business is and what it does, helps you imagine, before any of this exists, just imagine in your own mind what a business in this area might look like. And, and this is an, an idea. Um, it's the first thing I cover in the book. It's called the five parts of every business. And so a, a lot of particularly early stage entrepreneurs are like, I need to write a business plan. You know, how do I write a business plan? What's a good business? Like, tell me all about this. It's it's very, very simple. Take a sheet of paper. You're going to write five headings on it. And he, he, these are the headings. Value creation, marketing, sales, value delivery, and finance. And so value creation is like, you're making something valuable for other people. So what are you making and who are you making it for? That's value creation. Marketing is if people don't know that you exist or your thing exists, they're not going to buy it. So how are you going to get their attention and make them interested in this thing you have to sell? Marketing. Sales is once you have their attention, you need to convince them to pull out their wallet, checkbook, or credit card and 
give you money for it. That's the sales process. How are you going to do that? Once you take someone's money, how are you going to give them the thing that you promised? Uh, because if you mm -hmm. don't, you're, it's a scam. It's not a business. And so what is, what is the delivery of the value look like? And finance is very simple. So for value creation and marketing and um, value delivery, you're spending money. For sales, that's the part of the business where money is flowing in. So finance is just the process of looking at how much money is flowing in from sales, how much money is flowing out in value creation, marketing, and value delivery. Are we bringing in more money than we're, we're spending? Because if, if that's not the case, we're in trouble. Something needs to change. But then also, is it enough? Is it enough to make all of your time and effort and attention worthwhile? Can you use the information you have at your disposal to make better decisions about either how to spend money or how to bring more money in? And so really, when you look at those five steps, value creation, marketing, sales, value delivery, and finance, that's what a business is. That's what a business does. And if you don't know the answer to any one of those five steps, that's a blank that you need to fill in before the business is going to work. And so for any business idea, this is the best place to start. You need answers to these questions. You need to have a clear picture of what this looks like and how it's going to work. And then from there, you can start to evaluate one idea versus another. You know, do we think the market for this is better than that? Do we think that this is something that we could build once and sell for a long period of time? Or are we going to require a, a large amount of investment ongoing? These are um, things that I talk about in the personal MBA um, called the 10 ways to evaluate a market, which is mm -hmm. once you have a clear idea of what's going on, then you can start to ask some more specific questions of like, is this the kind of thing that seems like it's gonna be a good fit for me? But you always start with a clear picture of what the business idea is first, and then you build on top of that by asking some more specific questions. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you took us back and you walked through kind of, you know, the elements of a business and what we need to think about, because I think that's so important. And I think that a lot of people start businesses without thinking those things through. And then they realize that their business has no margin, that their business expenses are, are you know, they priced it wrong and, and they're not making a profit. And so I think all of that is really, really important. So thank you for walking us back. Now, let's sure. say we, we did map those things out. How then can we decide or what are the signs that we should look for when it comes to our market? So like, you know, deciding if there's people that will actually want to buy our product. How do we how do we go about understanding if we found a good market? Yeah, let's let's go through some of the the 10 ways to evaluate a market in more detail, because there there are a lot of specific useful things to think about in this process. Um, the place I always start is is urgency. Like, is this something that people are going to buy right away without hesitation, without caring too much about the price, without knowing all of the details? If so, you're in good shape. So, for example, um, let's say cures to cancer. Um, that's something that the entire world is going to buy right away, no hesitation. Doesn't don't care how much it costs, right? Like, give it to me now. There are a lot of business ideas that fall on the extreme other end of urgency. Like, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. It's kind of interesting. Um, when you're talking to customers, it might feel like a certain amount of apathy of like, huh, okay, cool. And so having, you know, when, when you're evaluating an idea, the more urgency you feel from customers, that's a really good sign that you're on the right track. Um, Things like market size go into this category as well, right? Like, are you selling to billions of people or are you selling to 10? Because the structure, if you're selling to, to major world governments, selling to 10 customers might be, a, frankly, a good business if you're selling, you know, billions of dollars of, of goods. But in general, the larger the, the potential market size, the more people who want this sort of thing, the better the market is. The same thing goes with pricing potential. And so... The higher the price, generally speaking, that you can charge, the more money that, come, that flows in and the more you keep of that as, as profit, you know, the more flexibility you have in terms of your pricing structure, the more opportunity there is. Mm -hmm. There are some related ideas to that too, which is cost of cu customer acquisition and cost of value delivery. So how much, you know, in terms of marketing and sales activity, do you have to spend upfront in order to get a new customer? And how much do you need to spend to actually deliver the value to them on the back end? So you could think like, 
an ideal business is there's a huge market. I can sell for an enormous amount of money. It costs me almost nothing to get a new customer. And it costs me almost nothing to sell to that customer once I have them. Like that's, that's an ideal situation to be in. Um, those are the big ones. And then there are some, I, I call this um, quality of life factors. So um, how unique is this? Like, is this something you and only you can provide? So, so Yap Media, for example, is you. Nobody else can do that. You know, th there are other things that might compete for the amount of attention, but there's not going to be another holla. That's not a, a, a concern. Um, the more unique you are, the better. Um, speed to market, which is, you know, from the time you're, you're doing this evaluation right now, how quickly can you have something out and selling to the market? And generally speaking, mm -hmm. faster is better, right? You know, versus something that you would need to invest in potentially for decades before you have something to sell. That's that's a, a barrier. Um, the same thing goes for upsell potential. And so sometimes there are very attractive businesses where the thing that you're selling up front is not necessarily the thing that's going to make you a lot of money over the long term. It's a way to sell other things uh, uh, on the back end. Um, so the the classic. Uh, Gillette razors and blades model, right? Like the, you know, the initial upfront sale of the razor is not as important as selling refills to the blades over a period of decades. Mm. There are a lot of businesses that fall into that category. Um, in some senses, you can, you can lose money on the initial sale and then just make up for it because the, the life, the lifetime value of that customer is so high that each additional customer brings in thousands and thousands of dollars in revenue. Insurance is a really great example of that. And then the, the last thing, which is one that I think an enormous amount about, um, which is evergreen potential. And so when you make this thing for sale, is this something that you need to continue to invest a lot in, in order to keep it relevant and to keep it selling? So technology is the extreme example of this, you know, uh, companies like Intel pouring billions of dollars into a chip fabrication factory that's going to be relevant for two years, and then those chips will be obsolete, and then they'll have to build another one. On the other extreme uh, example of this, it, books are fantastic for this because you write the book once, and you just print lots of copies. And if you write it well and correctly, it continues to sell for a very long period of time, and you can update it if you want to, but you don't have to, it's going to continue to be relevant over a very long period of time. And so, yeah, in general, I really like to think about businesses. Starting a business is a lot of work. And so I like to think about like, what are the things that I could invest time, attention, money, and energy into now that are going to be just as relevant 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line without additional effort required on my part because that makes every offer that I, that I make, every business that I build, an asset that keeps ticking in the background. And then instead of you know, continuing to invest in keeping that thing running, I can build another one and then another one. And just over time, build this portfolio of businesses and products that, um, that continues to do well. And I, I think at least for my for my personality and the way that I like to, to go through life, that's a really fun way of running a business that I think is, is underrepresented and, and much more possible today than it ever has been. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Josh, you are so smart. I could just hear your voice all day telling me business <laughs> advice, honestly, <laughs> like I'm sure our listeners are going to love this episode. So earlier in the conversation, you were talking about how it's really tough to get people to learn something new, to introduce a product that is not on the market. And you essentially have to educate them about this mm -hmm. problem that they never knew they had. And that's like such an uphill battle. It's easier to go with a product that people already know and use and create a better mousetrap for a lack of better words, right? Yeah. Talk to us about some of the characteristics of a good product or service. Yeah. So I, I think this is there this is something that I talk about, I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's chapter four in um in value delivery. There's this idea of of quality, which is all about this like 
what what is quality what makes a good thing good and the definition of this actually comes out of the the engineering sciences um so the engineering definition of quality is fitness for purpose like does it do the thing that you're using the product to do if so yeah that's great if not you it's not so great and you need to improve that and so there was a, a, a professor at Harvard Business School. His name was uh, David A. Garvin. And this would have been like the late 80s-ish, um, where he came up with, with a, a list or a, a, a framework of like, okay, let's, let's, go, let's take, take, a, take another step and like try to define quality. And, and he broke it down into eight factors. Performance, features, reliability, conformance, durability, serviceability, aesthetics, and perception. So like performance is pretty straightforward. Does it do the thing? Great. If it doesn't do the thing, not great. Features is how many things does it do? Um, if it does more than one thing, that's that's awesome. You're getting more value for from the from the product. If it only does one thing, it better do that thing really well. Um, reliability is like, can I can I rely on this? Is it gonna break? Is it gonna malfunction? Am I gonna get a result that I didn't expect? Um, conformance is a more specific one, like how well does it meet the established standards? So like are defects common? Is this, if this is an, a, an interchangeable part, how interchangeable are the parts? Can I re rely on swapping things out if I need to? Durability, how long will it work? Serviceability, if something goes wrong, can I fix it? Or is, do I need to throw it away and buy another one? And then the, the last two are becoming more and more important. Um, aesthetics is, is, do I like it? Is it, mm -hmm. is it beautiful? Is it pleasurable? Is it attractive? Do I feel good when I'm, I'm using the product or, or the service or the offer in, in the way that it is, it is intended? And then perception is, is the fuzzy reputational or social factor. Like, does it make other people perceive me in a certain way? Do I get a certain amount of, of status? Do the results that I get from using this thing outperform my expectations of it? Or do they underperform? Is it, is it not as good as I expect it to be? And so that's where you start getting into the, uh, the fuzziness of things like brand, of like, you know, all of the surrounding factors of an offer. Do I feel good? Does it make people perceive me differently? Is this something that, that, I get some intrinsic social value out of using, or is this a very utilitarian thing? And so I, I really like, in general, I really like frameworks and checklists and things like this because there's, there's a lot going on in business. And so being able to think of like, like, okay, what is a good thing? Here are seven or eight factors that I can think through real quick and, and figure out, okay, where are we in a good spot and where, where could some investment be fruitful? Yeah. And now with the pandemic and kind of the whole world changing, do you find anything different in terms of what creates a, an exceptional product or service right now? Like, does one of those characteristics kind of stand out more than ever now? Yeah, I, I think the the socialness, just because of, of the nature of the, the time in history where we are, where people are starved for connection and starved for being able to interact with other people and, and feel together in, in a, a, a time mm -hmm. and space where we are all not together. I think there are a lot of things that would not necessarily be as valuable now. You know, so, so think of uh, the social networks as, as a thing and new ones popping up all the time. The demand for that has certainly increased uh, during this period because A, people have more time and B, people have this felt human need to connect with other people in it because all of the other outlets are, are not as available. And so this is, this is something that um, I talk about in, in chapter one called the, um, the core human drives and, and the drive to bond, the drive to, to connect with other people, to form relationships and strengthen those relationships is really strong. And, and so when that need, when people are used to meeting that need in one way, and that way is no longer available, 
that means that a market is going to form to meet that need in some other way. And you can see it through social media. You can see it in the rise of companies like Zoom. Um, th there's all sorts of, you know, th that, that energy is going to find an outlet. And, and in, uh, in the time that we are, are uh, living now, um, that a lot of that's happening online. And it's, it's yeah. nice that we have the tools to solve it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think digital products are just really skyrocketing right now. Even, you know, my social media agency, for example, I feel like if COVID didn't happen, I'm not sure I would have started it so soon. I think I w right. it would have happened maybe two years from now, but there was such a big demand because everyone's just, there's the only game is online right now. So if you, if you have those skills, you know, it's a really good time to, to start a business. Um, okay. So where was I going? Uh, where is it going? Sorry, this never happens. I don't know. Yeah, no worries. Train of thought. <laughs> Let me think. Well, while we're, I'm get, something. Yeah. getting a little washed out in the background. Is that okay? Yeah, you know, um, the the recording is going to look a lot better in the real version. Okay, so cool. This washed out is just, I think it's just like bandwidth issues. So it kind of like just. I'm sure I look fuzzy and stuff. The actual recording will look perfect unless there's some lighting issue that happened on your end. Yeah, no, it's, these windows are west facing. And so as the sun is going down, we're, we're getting a little bit oh. more light. But uh, OK, got it. Got it. Uh, I'll tell my team to, to color correct it. So you'll be fine. OK, unless Let you want to unless you want to switch like while we're taking this pause, if you want to switch where you're facing, that's also fine. No, this is cool. I, I just uh, will stop the aperture down a little bit so it, it doesn't blow out quite so much. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So one of the things that I want to discuss is testing our idea. Because like you said previously, you kind of outlined the factors you should think about when launching a business. I think it's important to test your idea before you invest too much money in it, into it, before you get outside funding. You need to make sure that it's a, a viable offering that people are willing to pay money for. So what, in your opinion, is the best ways to test our idea before we launch our business? Yeah, there there are a couple, and and you're right. There are some critical assumptions that go into to every business, like how much can I sell this for, and how many people are going to buy it, and how much am I going to spend, and you know, making the math work is is a really important part of the whole process. And so there are two primary methods that I really like to use uh, for for this. The one, uh, the first one is uh, is the fastest and the easiest, which is called shadow testing, and this is essentially so it has many different forms. Um, sometimes it's called concept testing. Sometimes there are prototypes involved, but it, but it's always this testing an idea with potential customers before you move, uh, before you make anything like just, you know, mm -hmm. an idea on a sheet of paper, um, just presenting it to the people who are most likely to buy from you and asking the critical question, which is, is this something that you're willing to pay for? And the strongest version of this test is you actually take orders from them. Like, yeah, sign on the dotted line. You know, we won't charge you until it's ready. But, you know, essentially think of what, what Kickstarter is, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's no product. There's a lot of development and, and sometimes manufacturing and, and long, expensive processes that need to happen before, before the, the product is ready. But the Kickstarter, it's just a page. It's just some images. It's, it's some, some text on the internet. There's nothing there. But it's enough that potential customers can look at it and say, oh, yeah, that sounds cool. That's for me. I would like to pre-order one. And Kickstarter makes mm -hmm. that very easy to do. And so for most forms of businesses, shadow testing is something that is, is very, very valuable and worth doing because it can help answer that critical question immediately. It, are you making something that people are willing to pay for? The longer term ver, uh, form of testing that, that is just as if not more valuable is field testing. And so it's making the thing and then you as the business owner, you, you, know, you and your staff and the people who are involved in this particular market, the best situations where the company improves to the greatest extent most quickly are very often the companies that use the thing that they themselves make. Because think of it from a speed of learning or a feedback cycle sort of thing. Like 
if you're using the thing that you make and something goes wrong or something breaks or you know something you know right away you you can act mm -hmm. on that information much more quickly than waiting for a bug report to come in from from a customer with incomplete information and incomplete context and so anytime there's an opportunity for you to use the thing that you make you end up improving the quality of the product or the offer much much faster than you otherwise would yeah that that is such great insight okay so let's say we tested we we have our business idea you know we wrote our little business plan we you know feel that we have a viable market and a viable product how do we decide you know pricing like what are the steps to decide how to price our product at this point okay so there is a there are multiple ways of of doing this testing um the, the thing that i like about uh, about pricing which i think is an underappreciated fact um i i call this in um i think this is chapter three of the book um in in sales um i i call this the the pricing uncertainty principle which is that like prices are 100 percent arbitrary and malleable you can charge any price for anything at any time without limitation like you you just you, you want to sell a rock for 10 billion dollars go nuts doesn't mean somebody's going to buy it but you have an enormous amount of flexibility in the number that you stick next to the, the price tag on something and mm -hmm. so with that there are a bunch of different ways that you can you can kind of triangulate your way into a price that makes sense and the the methods that most commonly come up um are replacement cost market comparison uh discounted cash flow which is the most financy way of pricing something and value comparison and so you know this is actually you know going back to our, our conversation of of background this is something that i learned by studying real estate and it becomes very very apparent when you do something like okay you, you have a house to sell well houses don't come with price tags attached to them you have to you have to put a price on it somehow how are you going to do it and so a replacement cost is just like well how much did it cost to build the house well that's a pretty good estimate of of at least a minimum of how much it's it's worth so let's add up all of that let's tack on some margin to compensate for for time and energy and you know that's that's a pretty good ballpark of what something's worth uh the market comparison method is very often the one that's used to sell houses like okay let's find another house kind of like this that has already sold well this house is probably roughly comparable to to this other one we'll charge this much discounted cash flow is like well okay let's say we decided to rent this house there's a series of payments that would come in from from the use of it and there are uh pretty involved financial formulas that say okay yeah if you can charge two thousand dollars three thousand dollars a month for this house then over a certain period of time accounting for interest rates and blah, 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 you get a lump sum payment of x that's how much the house is worth and then you get into the one that has the most promise which is value comparison hmm. and and value comparison is just like understanding from the customer's perspective what is awesome about this particular thing to the person who's buying it how valuable are those things and how much might they be willing to spend because this thing has unique benefits that they can't find anywhere else so the example with a house um might be a run down not so great house in every other respect but if it was owned by elvis presley at one point that house is going to be worth millions and millions and millions of dollars because mm -hmm. there's something intrinsic about the house that is valuable to a certain type of customer and so it, when, when it comes to profit and profit margin value comparison is where you get your maximum profit and your maximum profit margin because you're really understanding what the customer is buying it for why it's valuable and then your pricing specifically based on that for entrepreneurs um there is as as a general rule new entrepreneurs tend to systematically underprice what they're offering based on the value mm -hmm. that they're they're providing 
I think a lot of that comes from a certain amount of insecurity or hesitation or, you know, one wanting approval, not necessarily knowing what the market will bear. Like, you know, uh, let's, let's play it safe and make sure that, that I give people good reasons to, uh, to, to sign up for this. My general rule of thumb for new entrepreneurs is take whatever price that you are initially thinking sounds reasonable and triple it. And you're probably in the ballpark of what the market will actually bear. Um, if you don't feel good about tripling it, at least double it. And you're, 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 you're in a more happy place. Um, I th I think I, <laughs> I don't know about you, Hala, but I definitely fell into this, this trap early on. Yeah. And you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that like, it just feels so uncomfortable the first time you ask for something that in your mind seems really unreasonable. And it is a very good feeling when the market proves that no, that no, really, that's all in your head. You don't have to worry about it so much. The market will will pay so much more than you expect. I totally agree. I hear this all the time. People undercharge. They don't realize how much their services are worth. They don't calculate or you know incorporate their own time into their offering as well. I see that happen a lot. And so I totally agree. Double or triple what you were originally going to ask for. Um, you'll be surprised. And if, if somebody's willing to buy it, then you, you know, did a good job with your pricing and then you just get a couple more people and maybe you need to, you know, focus it on a certain segment of your market. Maybe your product is not for everyone, right? So mm -hmm. I totally agree. Um, before we move on, you are getting really washed out. Yeah, let me see if I can. fine for the audio, but I'm just wondering, maybe you can like close your window or something because I don't want us to like not be able to do micro content or something that would suck for you. Yeah, so. no problem. Let me, uh, let me see what I can do. I'll be right back. Yeah, of course. It's like a hundred times better. Damn. I wish I told you to do that before. Yeah, it's no all worries. good. We'll, and I will we'll uh, be able to adjust one. the camera. So I look reasonably human. No, you look great now. Now it's all right. good. All right. Perfecto. Okay. So with pricing, I know you mentioned that value comparison is the best way to get the most margin, right? Mm -hmm. So talk to us about high ticket offers because this is like a buzzword now. Everybody's talking about their high ticket offer. How can we, you know, what is the best way to create a high ticket offer? What are the elements of a high ticket offer? Like what do we need to think about there? Yeah, there, there are some structural advantages in having a high priced, high profit offer, whatever that offer might be. Um, and it, it, just think about it in terms of like, you may have fewer customers who are willing to pay that price, but that also means less value delivery cost. It means less customer support. It means potentially less marketing, less sales. You know, there's, there's a lot of advantages to just like having a group of people who are really into whatever it is that you do and them paying enough that you can focus a lot of, of time and attention on them. And so I, I think it's it's one of those things that what the high price offer is is extremely market dependent, right? Like you're finding your super fans, you're finding the people who are 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 the most into or get the most value of whatever it is that you have to offer. And a lot of times the benefits of a high value offer are pretty soft when it comes down to it. So um there's there's a whole class. This is a, a concept that comes out of um, economics called a Veblen good, which is you know essentially products that sell better because they're priced much much higher than other things are. Um, so mm -hmm. think like you know a Rolex doesn't tell time any better than like a Timex. It's it's the cost of the thing. It's the signaling. It's it's everything surrounding the purchase. That's the true value of the good. And part of that comes from the price and the perceived exclusivity and all of those fuzzy factors around the actual product. And so, yeah, I, I think there's a certain element of the high price offer. These are very important customers. You as a business owner are incentivized to pay an enormous amount of attention to them and making sure they're having a good experience. And there's a, a certain amount of intrinsic value in that. But then there's also an enormous amount of value around the social positioning or the social status, the exclusivity, the opportunities that might come from having a 
more exclusive offer for for the best customers that you have. Yeah. Okay. So this was such great information. Now let's say, you know, we've got our product, we've tested it, you know, we've got our pricing, we go to, you know, speak to our customers. We've got people who have paid, but then we start getting our first objections in sales. People are mm -hmm. starting to, you know, give their objections. What are the different kind of objections that we can anticipate and how can we counteract them? Yeah. So I think there's, there's a, a whole bunch of different objections that, that come into play whenever you're trying to convince somebody of something. And the first thing to, to, to think about or realize is, is there is a psychological tendency when we feel like we're being pushed into making a decision or pushed into doing something. Um, this is an idea called a reactance. Like there's an automatic desire to push back. So uh, think of the the stereotypical really bad used car salesman who who's just trying to to sell you anything as long as you buy it today. Uh, yeah, that that's something that you you want to av avoid the feeling or avoid the perception of because it actually works very much not in your favor. It pushes customers away from you instead of uh, pulling you to, them towards you or or wanting. Um, I think this was. There was a, a, a sales trainer, the, the late Jim Rohn, who talked about the best position that you can find yourself in is positioning yourself to the customer as an assistant buyer. You're not there to convince them of anything. You're not there to, to sell them a bill of goods. Your job is to help understand who they are, what they need, what would be beneficial. You have some subject matter expertise in this problem that they're trying to solve for themselves. And so your job is to be their assistant in making this, this very important, very valuable decision and finding whatever is best for them. And so as a way of, of framing in your own mind, you know, sales kind of has these icky connotations that a lot of particularly new entrepreneurs are very uncomfortable with. Um, when really you can reframe most of that as you are making friends with someone you've never met before. You're you're trying to understand what would be good for them. And you're trying to help them make a really good decision, whatever that good decision happens to be for them. And when you think about sales in that way, it becomes a lot less scary and it becomes a lot more interesting and a lot more fun. Uh, because it also takes the pressure off of yourself of like, oh, you know, I I need to to I need to persuade, I need to convince, I need to, you know, be, be the one who gets someone to do something that they might not want to do. No, that's, that's not how it works at all. And so yeah. there are a lot of different methods that you can use to do this. Um, the, the two best, you know, we talked about value-based selling, like really understanding what the customer wants or needs. And then there's a, a, a kind of a, a close, a close technique, it's not exactly the same thing, but there are similarities called education-based selling, where it's you are helping the customer become a better customer of the thing that you sell. And so there's there's a, a quote by a lady, her name is Kathy Sierra, that I just love. It, uh, and, and paraphrasing a, a, a relatively long quote, she says, don't sell better cameras, help your customers become better photographers because when they become better photographers, they're going to want better cameras. And so just helping, helping people understand mm -hmm. more about what it is that you do, it encourages them to want more. And when they want more, they're pulling from you instead of you pushing on them. Now, there are a lot of, call it structural barriers to making a sale. Um, the classic objections, like, I don't have enough money. I don't know if this is worth it. I don't know if it'll work. I, there's a there's a special case. I don't know if it'll work for me. So I see that this is a good thing. I've seen seeing this work for other people. Yeah, I believe that, but I don't. I'm a special case. I'm I'm the one you know to which the common market does not apply. And the best thing about those kinds of objections, you you know in advance they're coming. They're always going to be coming. They apply to everything. Mm. And so that combination of the mindset shift of I'm an assistant buyer, I'm going to try to help them make the best decision that I can. And being a prepared seller, 
knowing well in advance the types of questions that a, that a customer is going to ask doing your research, having answers to those things before the sales conversation uh, actually takes place, that puts you in the best uh, position to to make the final sale. Let's play a game because uh, this got my wheel spinning and, and a cool activity that we could do. Let's sure. pick a product and I'll say some objections and you can you know counteract my objections about that specific product. So you pick the product. Um... Let me see what let, let's let's do the uh, the camera thing since we we brought that up earlier. Okay, so camera. Josh, I think the camera is too expensive. Well, it, it's a really a, a question of of what you value, right? Like, so if let, let's let's say hypothetically, if you owned a camera, what would be the kinds of things that you used the camera for? For shooting YouTube videos. Shooting YouTube video. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, and you're using your YouTube videos for, for what exactly? Help me understand what that looks like. To promote, to, to promote my podcast. Okay. Interesting. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, maybe the video features of a camera are more important to you than capturing still images. Am I understanding that right? Yes. Okay. So there are a couple of different kinds of cameras that we can look at here. And there's, there's this whole class that are essentially optimized for still images. Those don't apply to you. So we're just, we're just going to ignore all of those. It's not what you're looking for. There are a bunch of different cameras now that come with an integrated video feature that will help you, for example, make sure that you're always in focus. And so, you know, everybody will be able to, to see your your eyes and your face clearly it will blur out the background you'll look amazing there are features that will help control the exposure so like how much light is entering the camera making sure that you know you look really great and then there's nothing weird going on with the image there are certain kinds of cameras that we can make sure uh, hook up directly to your computer and so whether you want to shoot video on the go or you're in your office and you want to shoot video uh, for, for your YouTube channel there. And so based on all, do those sound like things that would be helpful in, in using this camera to do what you want to do? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. So based on those features, here are three different options. Camera A, camera B, and camera C. And we could have this conversation over a longer period of time to understand, you know, uh, the trade-offs between these features. Like, you know, so maybe hooking up to a, a computer is, would be a really handy thing to do because you always shoot video in your office. You don't shoot it anywhere else. And yeah. so I could confidently recommend camera C to you because based on how you're going to use the camera, this has the best balance of features for what you want to use it for. And this is the price of that. Yeah. So basically you were leading with value, right? What did you yes. unpack what you just did there? You were leading with value. Did you do anything else? Value comparison maybe? Yeah. So, so what I, this is a, an example of something called qualification, which is when, when you have a new customer, not every customer you talk to is going to be a good customer and not all of them are going to be a good fit for whatever it is that you have to offer. And so my first question is like, how are you going to use this is a qualification question. Like what, what is the kind, like you're saying that you want a camera, but there are lots of different cameras that do lots of different things. Um, so if, for example, you're, you were an art student and you're going to be shooting architecture images in black and white, and you need the most crazy detailed, like that's a completely different ballpark of camera. And so by asking mm -hmm. a few questions up front, you can really narrow down like, okay, is this a good customer? Is this a customer I can help? What is the thing that they would find most helpful? And then of that, I can ask some additional questions to get more information to kind of triangulate what the, the what potential solutions might be. Yeah. The other... So why didn't you jump to, sorry for interrupting. Yeah, sure. Why didn't you jump to discounting? Like, why didn't you just give me a discount? What's the problem with giving a discount? Yeah, I think discounts are sometimes a useful tool and sometimes very dangerous 
and more dangerous from a strategic standpoint, less so from an individual transaction standpoint. When you think about it, discounts just um, eliminate your margin or reduce your margin to a certain extent. And so sometimes there's a certain amount of value that's added by the urgency of an expiring discount. Like, you know, okay, there's a special sale going on. You need to make a decision within the next day or so or an opportunity is gone. That can be useful. But unless you understand exactly what it is that the customer wants to buy and why they want to buy, you're not in a position to talk about even price yet because the customer doesn't have as much confidence in your suggestion, what it is that you're trying to, to get them to do. So by helping, both by collecting more information from the customer, like what is the thing that's going to help them the most, you're getting that information and you can use that to guide the conversation in a productive direction. But think about it from the customer's perspective. You're exhibiting a lot of interest in them, in their problem, what it is they're trying to do, what's important, what's not. And so when you have that conversation, towards the end of it, the customer feels very well heard, understood, valued. And so instead of just like, oh, you need a camera, you should buy this because it's $20,000 and I would make my bonus this month if I were able to sell it. It becomes much more from the customer's perspective, like, no, this person knows a lot about what they're talking about. And I trust that because they have the information, they're guiding me in a direction that's going to be good for me. Yeah. And then is there ever a situation where we should lead with a less expensive product or offering to kind of get a customer in the door or get that, you know, uh, name brand under our list of logos that we have? Like, is there ever like a case for getting a, a cheaper customer in the door? Yes. Okay. So the, there are two, two broad situations where this is valuable. Um, the first is called a loss leader. And so that's, you know, the, the selling a, an offer at a loss at the beginning, because you know, over the lifetime of your relationship with that customer, they're going to buy a lot from you. And so uh, you can see this uh, a lot of times where, you know, memberships are becoming much more of, of a, a market trend. And very often mm -hmm. it would be like, you know, the, the first purchase that you make from us, we're going to give you 20% off to make that purchase or 15% off or whatever it is. The reason that makes sense is because once you're a customer, you're highly likely when you have this need again, you're going to come back and purchase from them over and over and over again. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the loss leader establishing a relationship that then you can sell to them over a longer period of time, excellent reason to use discounting. The other thing that you can do, and this, this is much more on the relationship end, um, this is called a damaging admission. And so it, it, sometimes it's in the context of like, okay, this is something that's not super great about the product. And I want to tell you about that up front. So you, you know about it. Sometimes in the context of, of sales, this is saying, okay, you know, going back to our cam camera conversation, there are three different cameras that fit what the things that you're looking for and you know a is five thousand dollars b is ten thousand dollars and c is fifteen thousand dollars the natural expectation for most customers is like oh yeah they're going to try to sell me on the fifteen thousand dollar one mm -hmm. and so you can sometimes gain a lot of trust with a new customer in particular by saying no you should buy the five thousand dollar one because it does everything that you need, the value is much better, and all of the other cool features that the other more expensive ones have, super overkill for you. You don't need it, don't worry about it. This is the one that you want. And so that that like admission against interest, you know, the subverting the expectation of I'm going to try to sell take you for the as as much money as I possibly can. Um you don't have to play that game. And that's where you really establish a good reputation of really looking out for your customer's best interests. Awesome. This was amazing advice. So all this information can be found in the personal MBA. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. 
Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team. As always, this is Hala signing off.